uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. May God add his blessing and understanding to his word. Amen. As we come to reflect a little bit on, on you, who you are, who Jesus is to us, we invite you to... Um, Help our ears to be ready to listen um, to what your Spirit's saying to us this morning. We just welcome you and we welcome your presence here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Well, this morning we're, we're going to look a little bit at questions. Um, I, I guess uh, if you're anything like me, you've got a question or two kind of floating about there in your brain somewhere. Um, you know, you've got big ones, you've got little ones. Um, some of you are probably thinking, why am I here? Um, they got a laugh in the first service. I don't know why I didn't get one here. Um, <laughs> obviously, you guys are deep and, and serious in your in your life questions. Um, some of the some of the questions we have, we're all aware of. Um, you know, they're at the forefront of our mind. Uh, there are there are other questions we have that are kind of sitting in the back there, that we kind of kind of push them down so we don't have to face them. You know, what option should I take here, or or, or, or maybe why is this always happening to me? You know? or, or maybe it's a big life question like who should I marry? Um, you know, for many of life's big questions, I used to have someone I used to go to, um, my dad. Um, unfortunately, that's no longer an option now. He's, he's got um, dementia, as some of you know. And so, you know, if I go to see him with a question, either he'll be asleep or he'll smile and laugh and say something that's kind of an inappropriate. Um, so, but, but the thing about questions is questions always require answers. We want answers, don't we? And so this morning we're going to be focusing in our groups, in our discussion groups, around three main questions that you can um, kind of uh, work, work through together in your groups. Um, one question is, um, a bit like I just said, who do you go to for your life's big decisions? Where do you go? Another question um, that we're going to ask in the groups is, is what makes you happy? And then the final question is, if you could ask God one question for an answer for a question, what would that be? See, I'm giving them to you now so you can start kind of percolating in the back of your mind so actually when you do go and sit in your groups, you don't feel like a Muppet trying to, trying to work everything out, you know. Um, so you've got a bit of time and space. Um, but some of, those, some of those questions might be really easy. Some of them can kind of be a little bit challenging. Um, like, what does make you happy? Ooh, man, <laughs> don't think about that too hard. You might burst a gasket. Um, but, but what we're going to be reflecting on, as well as questions, though, today, is some of the things that Jesus had to say about himself and, and how he's relevant to some of the big questions that we face in our lives. So we're going to begin with a little bit of a, a clip from the video. Um, so, right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nikki. Welcome to Alpha. Life is busy. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? What's happening today? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions. Like, why am I here? Where am I heading? Is this it? Is there more to life than this? These are life's big questions, but there's rarely enough time to think them through properly. We all have different perspectives on the meaning of life and faith, 
And Alpha is an opportunity to explore life's big questions. This is a great place to come together and talk about them openly and honestly. I'm Gemma. I'm Toby. And this is Alpha. Um, I go on Google. Google. I definitely Google. I go on Wikipedia. Internet. I uh, scroll through all the different answers and then I try and combine it and then make my own kind of like cornerstone. Or my friends. I don't ask big life questions. It's too hard to answer. Google? Or my grandmother? I meditate or I read. When I have a big life questions, I probably go to my family. I haven't really had any mess with what they say. My mom or my dad, basically. My mom or my dad, maybe my grand. I get most of my answers from the library in any section there because I don't really trust the people that I'm around. The key is always to yourself. You got to figure some things out for yourself. If I'm confused, I go to him first. And he confuses me more. But when it's something more personal, I try to find it within myself first. Friends of mine told me that the first night they came to Alpha, they sat in their car for half an hour waiting and watching people going in. And eventually when they'd seen enough normal looking people going in, they thought they'd give it a try. And one thing that might be going through your mind is, am I going to be the only one there who doesn't believe all this stuff, who's not a Christian, that doesn't go to church? Well, if that's you, then you're in the right place. Alpha is designed for people who wouldn't call themselves Christians or who are not regular churchgoers. It might feel a bit strange to be discussing life and faith with people that you've never met before. But the best thing about Alpha is often the great friendships that are formed over the weeks. For much of my life, I was not remotely interested in Christianity. In fact, I don't think I'd ever come to something like Alpha. I was not brought up as a Christian. My father was a secular Jew. He was an agnostic. And my mother didn't go to church. Uh, and I had no interest at all in Christianity. First of all, I just thought it was so boring. Everything to me about church, Christianity, religion was just dull and dreary. And it kind of made me feel a little bit guilty. I didn't know why, but I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I also thought it was untrue. I, I thought I'd sort of thought it through and uh, I'd come up with these intellectual objections and I call myself very pretentiously, I call myself a logical determinist. And I quite enjoyed arguing with people who call themselves Christians. And at university, I had a bit of a reputation for being an argumentative atheist. And I also thought it was irrelevant to my life. I couldn't see how someone who'd lived 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, could have any relevance to my life today. It just seemed outdated and irrelevant. But at the same time, looking back now, I would say something was missing. I say that because I don't think I was living in the moment. I was always looking forward to the next thing in life. So when I was at school, I was thinking, when I finish my exams, maybe that will be when I'm going to really start to enjoy life. I finished my exams, and then after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. And I thought, well, maybe when I've left school, that will be what life's all about. And then I left school, and after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. I thought, well, maybe the answer is to get a girlfriend. And somehow, I don't know how I managed it, but I managed to find a girlfriend. Again, after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. And, and basically, there was something missing. I was longing for more. <coughs> probably, probably sitting in an alpha course, and I remember that guy. Oh. <clears throat> About a month ago, I was heading down to Wellington. Um, some of, as some of you know, I was going, uh, for a bunch of reasons, I was heading down. Um, part of it, I was going down on study leave, and, and so I was popping along to a conference, along with Sarah Ramoy and Melissa. Um, so that was one reason. Uh, there was another reason, though. I was going down to see my dear sweet mother, because uh, um, she's listening now, um, and, and bring her and her dog Honey up to Auckland for a bit of a break. Um, and so that was another reason. There was a third reason I was going. I was going to pick my daughter Alicia up, because um, she'd been down in Wellington. But there was a fourth reason, and that was probably the reason I was really looking forward to the most, uh, because Alicia had just gotten a new car, and it meant I was going to get the opportunity to drive it. Um, and, 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 you know, of course, it was newer than mine, it was flasher, it, had, it was nice and shiny, it had these cool gadgets that, you know, the, some of the more modern cars have. Um, it even told me that when I'd been driving a little too long that I needed a brake, uh, which I'm not really sure if I liked, but it, it was kind of cool. 
Um, and, and I got my wish, of course. Even better, when we went home, came to coming home, the desert road was snowed over, so I got to go up the east coast, so I even got more hours in. Um, but it was really interesting, a couple of weeks ago, I was um, just about to head off to tennis, and the, uh, Alicia's car was at the front of the drive, and so I just grabbed the keys and took it. I was halfway there, and as I was driving, I thought, well, this is just like a normal car now. <laughs> have, you, have you had that experience? And it's like, um, the thrill had gone. Uh, and, and what I've been looking forward to three weeks ago, now it was like, yeah, okay. Um, and isn't it funny how we can have these ideas as to what will make our life better? Um, and then we get there, and then all of a sudden we think, well, what next? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not, it's not as if it was all that we thought it would be. It, it's almost as if there has got to be more to life. Uh, the, the actor Jim Carrey said this. He said, I wish everyone could get rich and famous and have everything they always dreamed of so that they would know that it's not the answer. You know, what a depressing lesson to learn, eh? Yeah. But, you know, often for us, you know, life doesn't turn out the way we think it ought to, but in those times when it does, it, it doesn't quite satisfy as much as we think it should. It's almost as if something's missing. Uh, the comedian, uh, Russell Brand, said this. He said, drugs and alcohol, they're not my problem. Reality is my problem. Drugs and alcohol are my solution to fill up that hole inside of me. Now, I mean, obviously Russell Brand's a bit of a weird guy. I mean, he kind of looks a little bit weird. Um, but there's a lot of truth in that statement, isn't there? You know, it's not the drugs that are the problem. It's the reality that's the problem. It's just the thing that he looks to solve that problem is probably going to cause him a lot more problems down the track. But what do we do about this sense of this gnawing sense of unfulfillment that we all carry? In the Bible, Jesus says this. He says, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me will not thirst. Now, obviously, here, just for context, Jesus wasn't talking about dinner time. He was saying that he was the solution to the one problem that has plagued humanity throughout history. This problem being a sense of emptiness of life, a sense of spiritual hunger, a lostness from our Creator. The late Freddie Mercury, lead singer of the rock group Queen, said, had this to say. He said, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. And that is the most bitter type of loneliness. Success has brought me world idolization and millions of pounds, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. And when it comes to an ongoing relationship, really the only one who can promise a, a, a one that lasts forever is God. Yes. And Jesus said this. He said, I am the way to that relationship, a relationship that fulfills like nothing else in this world can. In fact, in John 14, verse 6, he said these words. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Very bold words, aren't they? Jesus spoke about himself in terms of an answer. A way for those who don't really know where they're going. The truth in terms of an answer to that unanswered to emptiness that we feel. And life. A life that offers meaning and purpose and security in this life and even beyond into death. So what is it that fulfills you? What is it that makes you happy? Maybe money. What makes me happy? Music. Music, ice cream, and cheese. Sleep makes me happy. No, going to the gym, see my friends, go to the pub, play football. Dogs. Alcohol. Uh, women. Pretty much. The idea of life in general makes me happy. Clothes. Uh, women. What's the last thing this? That's a really good question. I don't know, I can't tell you. I think we're supposed to learn a couple of things. There's nothing more. I'm still figuring that out, to be honest. Uh, no. It's live in the moment. Absolutely. I strongly believe that there's more to life than this. No idea. Sorry. <laughs> mm. 
What are you thinking? Right. I think when we get, head up to the panel, oh, doesn't that look sweet? <laughs> so um, some of you know this is a picture of my little girl, Alicia. Uh, for those of you who know her, you'll realise she probably looks a little bit different now that she's 21. Um, she's a little bit taller, but she's also got glasses now. Um, not long after this photo was taken, Marie and I started to notice her eyes were starting to cross over uh, to the point that she was actually watching TV at right angles to the screen. So her face would be headed in that direction or the TV was there. Um, and so we figured something's not quite right. We were, that, we were pretty smart parents. Um, and so we took her to an optician and said, hey, what's going on here? And the doctor said to us, uh, optician said to us, he said, listen, he said, your daughter, she can barely see. Um, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is legally blind, Alicia was a nine. And, and so, of course, we got her measured for glasses straight away. Uh, and then the time came to, uh, when it was time to pick, her, pick them up. So we went down to the mall in Potorua where we lived. And uh, Marie and Alicia went down um, in particular. And, and Alicia, um, they kind of came and she was handed her glasses. And she was about three and a half-ish? No, just over two and a half at that time. So she got these glasses and she put them on. And, and she, she looks around. And she takes them off again. And she puts them on again. And then she just runs straight out of the shop. <laughs> uh, uh, unfortunately, which was really unusual for Alicia. That wasn't unusual for Nissi, but that was really unusual for Alicia at the time. Uh, and so anyway, Marie's trying to pay, and Alicia's looking around, and then she just takes off. And so Marie um, finishes, you know, uh, gets the receipt and runs out, and she sees Nissi, uh, Alicia run all the way down to the end of the mall and into a shop. And so she walks all the way down to see, and it's the pet shop. <laughs> and, and, she, um, and all of a sudden she's just looking just in wonderment at what's around her because all of a sudden these fuzzy kind of moving blobs that, were kind of, that she'd been looking at, they would now kind of transformed into these cute furry little animals. And, and the lenses made a massive difference. And, and what I want to suggest to you is that's this a great way to help us understand what Jesus offers us because essentially Jesus um, is the lens by which we see God. Uh, the one, the, the God who created us, the God who created all of creation. And so what we think we might know or, or not know about God can be confirmed through Jesus. Um, in Colossians chapter 1, uh, one of the books in the Bible, it talks about Jesus being the visible image of the invisible God. But he's not only the lens by which we see God, because um, that, that has an impact on us too, but it become, he becomes the lens in which we start to see the world around us. And, we, and, and the lens in which we start to see our place in the world. Jesus changes the way we look at things. And, and, and maybe some of you might say, well, that's wonderful for you, Nick. I'm glad that that's how that works for you. Maybe not so much for me. But maybe what if we think about this logically? You know, because what if Jesus says is true, then it's simply not a truth that just applies to me and no one else. It applies, I mean, it's either true or it's not. C.S. Lewis, the writer of um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, put it this way. He said, Christianity is a statement which, is, if it's false, it's of no importance at all. And if it's true, it's of infinite importance. But the one thing it cannot be is moderately important. There are no half measures here. It's either true or it's not. And when Jesus says that he is the truth... He's, he's putting himself in this place, he's, and he's not simply offering a few good ideas for you to live your life by, or ten steps to make a better you. He's saying, what I have is worth taking on board. And when we talk about truth, it's not simply a matter of knowing facts about him. Uh, the Hebrew concept of truth, which was part of Jesus' culture that he came from, was um, truth was understood as an experiential truth. Truth that came from not simply knowing facts and figures, but through experience. A little bit like the combination of the head and the heart. Um, a bit like you might know a person, both in terms of facts, but also in terms of experience. Um, take Marie, my wife, for example. Uh, Marie and I have been married for over 25 years now. And, yeah, and oh, I'm glad you <laughs> That's good. Yep, still going. Um, wasn't expecting that. Um, um, but uh, but I, I know plenty of facts about Marie. Um, I know her age. I checked. Um, I know her birthday. I know the colour of her eyes. Um, but having lived with her now for more time than I've lived with anyone else, 
Um, I know certain things about her that they're kind of hard to quantify. Like the way Marie's a little bit of a mix of between the arty and the practical. In a weird combination, I haven't figured out how to explain that yet. Um, I, the, like the way Marie kind of likes chocolate and has minimal time for flowers. Um, like the way Marie remembers conversations from years or even decades ago with almost word-for-word -word accuracy. That kind of sucks. <sighs> <laughs> and, and then when she buys presents for people, she actually thinks about what they'd like before she buys them, unlike someone else. <laughs> now, you might be surprised to know this, but these truths didn't come in the handbook I got when I married Marie. These were truths I learned as I got to know her. And in the same way, knowing Jesus is both a mix of facts, which we'll talk a little bit more in the next week, um, but it's also growing in terms of relationship as we grow in discovering who Jesus is. So Jesus said, he's the way, and Jesus said, he's the truth. But then finally, Jesus also said that he's the life. Jesus came to deal with the things in our lives that stop us living our life to the full. And he came to offer us a hope that we would be able to live a full life. A life that offers freedom and purpose and joy. I hate shopping. I loathe it. I, I think I'm allergic to shopping. But occasionally my wife Pippa persuades me to go shopping and just after Christmas uh, it was the sales and she persuaded me to go shopping and we went into the shop and we bought this very nice new sweater, uh, the same colour as all my other sweaters, and um, we left the shop and we went to buy a present for her. And we went into this ghastly shop, it was so crowded, it was unbelievable. And even Pippa had had enough and she said, OK, we're leaving. So we went to leave and as we left, the security alarm went off. And the security guys moved in very quickly and they stopped us all from leaving. And like the crowd that was trying to leave was stopped and the crowd that was trying to come in was stopped. And we were